four, three, two, one. Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's SANS webcast, Java on the Server, What Could Possibly Go Wrong? My name is Carol Auth of the SANS Inst Institute, and I will be moderating today's webcast. Today's featured speaker is Adrian de Bupre, Certified SANS Instructor. And with him, we have Jason Blanchard, SANS Pen Test Curriculum Marketing Manager. If during the web webcast you have any questions for our presenters, please enter them into the questions window located on the GoToWebinar interface at any time. Please note that this webcast is being recorded, and a copy of the slides and recording of this webcast will be available for viewing later today and can be found on the SANS registration page. And with that, I'd like to hand the webcast over to Adrian. Hello everyone, welcome to Webcast and welcome to the show. We're here to talk about web application vulnerabilities, exploitation, and things. So to give you a little bit of background, I am the primary instructor and a co-author of Security 642 with SANS, which is the Advanced Web Application Penetration Testing, Ethical Hacking, and Exploitation Techniques course. And one of the topics in that course is frameworks, one of which is Java. And just to give you some background, I remember in about, I think it was about 2000, 2001, when a sysadmin said, Adrian, the developers asked me to put Java on the server. And I said, what? I don't understand. What do you mean, put Java on the server? They said, well, there's this Java server thing, and they want to put it on the server for their application. I said, well, what could possibly go wrong with that Java on the server? It's not like we've had, wait, no, we have had Java issues by that point. And many of the Java issues that came up were still in the future. But we looked at it and went, well, it does run in a sandbox, so it should be okay, right? It's not as though Java could escape the sandbox and do bad things to the server. Well, apparently this can happen. And believe it or not, within the past six months, I do penetration testing and I do it as a third party. One of my clients looked me straight in the face and said, Adrian, we run Tomcat as root. Can you explain to us how we got compromised? And I said, well, I think you just said you run Tomcat as root. And they said, well, it makes the application work better. And I said, oh, well, that's interesting. In case you're curious, when Adrian says, oh, that's interesting, it's, I guess, my private euphemism for, I don't think that's a very good idea. Insert um, other possible explanations for Adrian saying, oh, that's interesting right there. Sometimes it refers more to, um, you know, that's probably not a good idea, or, wow, that's really, really bad. So. Back in the day when you wrote Java, you wrote JSP code and you wrote it manually. You, wrote, you opened up VI or Notepad or other text editors, not the one that starts with E, we don't use that one, and you wrote your code. And bad things could happen. Enter a few years later, frameworks. So frameworks were basically reusing code, reusing libraries, but also having a way for developers and architects to create applications without writing common functions by themselves. For example, the framework could do session management and take care of the session token and access control if you let it. It could also take care of authentication, take care of letting you log in, and often have application program interface or API calls. So frameworks became a good thing. And these frameworks were based on many things. We'll talk about them later, but one of which was Java. Who knew Java on the server? It still freaks me out a bit. So this was a good thing in that there could be consistency in page logic, page layout, and the developer didn't have to copy and paste things or make sure everything was consistent. Hypothetically, the framework could do it for them. So they got security through better application development process, which is great. And if they used the libraries built into it, for example, to do encryption, that would be a good thing. 
and there could be integration for things like databases, other data stores, and this is a good thing as well. And Frameworks introduced the concept of MVC, or Model View Controller. So when you architected or designed the application, you'd have a consistent model, meaning where the data is stored, how it's stored, the schema for the data, and how it moves around, how you interact with the data. Back then, primarily server side. Then you had a view where different devices could have a different view presented. You could have different browsers that see different parts of the application in different ways. You could also have compiled client-side code, like IoT devices, industrial control systems that also, for example, talk to web servers. And of course, the controller is the logic. This is actual enforcement of the logic flow through the application, and it controls how you interact with the model, the data in the application, and other things. And you can also have push-pull, for example, with other technologies like WebSockets. So frameworks give you a whole bunch of things, and they've evolved significantly over the years. Back in the day, there was Struts version 1. Now we have Struts version 2. So a newer development is the front-end frameworks that interact with the back-end, and you can have MVC also operating inside the client, in many cases a browser, and often running in JavaScript, perhaps with cascading style sheets, or CSS. So this is where we can have a view dynamically doing the DOM in the browser. We can have dynamic interaction with the back end using, for example, XHR or XML HTTP requests or AJAX. You can also have front-end logic and front-end data storage. So applications changed a whole lot over the years. So back-end frameworks initially, then back-end and front-end frameworks, and we're often seeing now, we're seeing applications that actually use more than one front-end framework and more than one back-end framework simultaneous. One of the key aspects of the front-end frameworks is, well, if it's running in your browser, you get to see it. You get to see the logic and get to see the data and how it's formed. And most importantly, you get to see how the browser makes requests to the backend API and how it processes the data when it comes back. So backend frameworks, frontend frameworks. So some of the frameworks are fairly minimalistic. Some of them are fairly full featured. You have .NET, etc. You have Java etc. You have PHP, Python, Ruby, and in fact many, many others. It's one of those strange things that it seems as though a new framework comes out uh, almost every couple of months, so it's hard to keep up. This slide is more than a year old, so I'm sure I'm missing things. Uh, there are things I haven't put on there yet. It's hard to tell you know, what to include in a course like 642 from which these slides come because the goodie, the oldies are still around. For example, Struts, ASP.NET, been around for a long time, PHP, Python, Ruby, they've all been around for a long time, but there are newer frameworks. There's also Go, for example. So, common things the frameworks share. They offer a layer of abstraction, so you can consider them as just a layer of abstraction between the application code itself and other interfaceable devices and things like data stores. They also give you a little bit of obscurity in that it seems to be a little bit of a black box unless you understand how they actually work. So we can actually approach frameworks if we can identify which one is there. Let's say, for example, struts. If we can identify which one is there, identify a version, we can just look for known vulnerabilities and weaknesses. Common default settings, common ways of setting up. In fact, many people who use a framework will tend to solve problems the same way, and that being, may introduce known weaknesses or habits. We can look for these design patterns weaknesses, and the key aspect of every framework is every application written in that framework inherits all the flaws from the framework and every library it uses. So that's the setup. Again, talking mostly about Java, we'll talk about struts and some of the underlying libraries. Now, 
if I'm not mistaken, there were three major struts vulnerabilities this year so far until today when a fourth one came out. I was like, no way, seriously? Um, and I was on duty at the SANS Internet Storm Center when the second one came out in September and I wrote up a short blurb about it and it was, ooh, that's nasty. And then I got another email and I said, oh, a second email about the same vulnerability. Excellent, and that's how I responded. And then they, they came back and said, no, no, look again. This is yet another struts vulnerability that makes two in the same day. So you could argue struts is having a rough year. I have not yet have time to dug in, dig into the one from today, but it appears as though, again, an underlying library called Jackson is vulnerable and may actually allow for remote code execution. I'm not sure yet. It may only be denial of service. So let's look at struts 2 for a moment and actually stop just briefly and say, if you do have any questions at any time, please feel free to type them in. I will answer them. Don't feel like you're interrupting me. I don't mind whatsoever. Um, very informal. And I do enjoy questions and banter and talking back and forth, uh, particularly in a live classroom environment. But I also do teach for SANS in the online format, and I'm quite familiar with the interface. So, struts one, the resource extension was .do or do. Struts two, they changed to .action. So this is one of the methods of trying to identify, is this struts? Does the file end with the extension .do or .action? Now, .do does not necessarily mean struts version 1, and .action does not necessarily mean struts version 2. However, they are one indicator. So, your input becomes an action to a form, and it uses a model, and has a method of calling an action. So, OGNL. OGNL is a newer, or a different, data interchange format. Typically, with web applications, traditionally we saw CGI format. So you'd see the resource, let's say, blah, 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 dot PHP, question mark, foo equals bar, and user equals Adrian, and password equals password in the URL. That's for a get, transfer of parameters in CGI format. You could also see them in a post as a payload. OGNL, JSON, XML, and others are different methods of exchanging parameters and data from client to server and server back to client. So input parameters here are called an OGNL statement and they run in the action or the model on the server and they're a method of interchanging data. There you go. Doesn't sound like a big deal, but when you have your own interchange data transfer thingy, it's possible there are problems. Now, Struts does have security built into it. It has a method of doing input validation, so it checks what it gets in, and there are default rules that are in XML files that come from the Apache project. So, if you know the default things that are validated, and you know that they haven't changed them, or you would assume or infer that they have not been changed in the server, you can perhaps form an attack if they have it enabled. You can also disable the validation in struts. And you might wonder, well, why would people turn off the security validation built into their framework? And the answer is, if it means their application works better, or if the validation performed by the framework prevents their application from working in their minds correctly. So they can turn things off, they can individually enable or disable validation rules, they can add more of course, or they can turn them all off. And the validation is the thing that's intended to prevent evil things from being introduced into the application. Fair enough. For cross-site scripting, struts can also do output encoding. So an output that is encoded should not execute in the browser, which is one of the means of preventing cross-site scripting, also known as script injection in the browser or the DOM, the document object model. That's the stuff running in your browser. So 
they will output in code by default a number of types of objects and write functions that put things in the browser, but they don't output in code all the things. So by default, they do validate a number of things. By default, they do output in code a number of things, but not all the things, which means if we know this and the defaults are in place, we might be able to form a bypass to pull off an attack. As well, the developer or sysadmin or whomever may choose to turn these things off, both the input validation and the output encoding. So Adrian, you're wondering, so what does this mean about my application, particularly if it's running struts? Because you kind of, kind of led with struts and Jenkins, like what does that mean? Well, the more I know about a framework, the more it's possible that there are vulnerabilities in the framework that the application also gets. In this case, in 2013, well, that's a fair time ago, four years, there have been a number of vulnerabilities in how Struts processes its own OGNL formatted input parameters and output parameters. For example, many of them were found and fixed in 2013. As we're seeing this year, there are other places where Struts does not necessarily parse or process inputs correctly. For example, in JSON, XML, or other formats, there can be issues in how Struts processes those things, and they might be exploitable. So OGNL is one possible issue. Let's talk about the most recent one. And you might wonder, Adrian, why'd you pick that one? Well, this is the one that we believe and strong indications, in fact, they pretty much admitted that Equifax was compromised with. So let's read through it. Blah, 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 Apache struts, this version, blah, 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 exception handling, blah, 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 arbitrary commands. Huh. Via crafted content, 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 HP header. Base score 10. Now 10 is bad, right? That, that, that's as high as it goes. 10 is like, this is the baddest ever. So when this particular CVE came out, this is a fairly nasty one. So you might wonder, if you saw this, you'd probably want to assess whether or not your application makes use of struts, which version it is, and can you patch it? Now, between you and me, and perhaps you've already come across this, I find many development groups, when they find a framework that they really, really like, they never, ever update it because they're worried if they update the framework or patch it, something will break in their application. And you know, this is actually not untrue. We have seen many cases where if they update the framework, the application does break. We've seen functionality changes in ASP.NET, for example, over the years that has caused us to have to rewrite applications. So it's not an unfounded fear. So, but if you saw this, it's basically saying worst thing ever. And it's out in March 2017. And it says, if you see a content header that has a CMD equals, it's probably really, really bad indicator that you've been compromised. And if you dig into this back in the day, you know, all of like, wow, nine months ago, that's like 10 years in internet time. We have a clear indicator of a major problem in a major framework used by many financial institutions and others, also government departments, and we see it's being exploited. They're saying it's being used right now. Look for content handlers containing this. And you may also want to look for other bad things happening in your app. So this came out, everyone should start looking, right? We should start examining what's going on with struts in our organizations. Let's imagine we were Equifax. And I have to stop calling them Equifax because I keep doing it and I know that's not right, but I think it's funny. It's not really funny if you're Equifax or if you've had your record stolen, but there you go. So 8th of March, US CERT sends an advisory and we know Equifax received it. They had a policy that said they must identify problems like this and patch almost immediately. Next day, the email apparently went around to all the IT and security staff. Six days later, now six days is not that bad considering but still, so six days later, apparently they scanned for struts. 
and didn't find it. More importantly, if they knew they had struts, apparently they did not find that they were running the vulnerable version. Sometime later, 29th of July, they see suspicious traffic leaving. 30th of July, they see even more. And later on, 30th of July, the application taken offline. This is all from public records. So we believe the intrusion started the 13th of May. Um, so they actually had a window of opportunity there of two months to patch, possibly. And this is indicative of a different problem that we're going to address and talk about in the new upcoming course called 460, which is the Enterprise Threat and Vulnerability Assessment course, which is currently finished being writing, being written, and we're doing a beta in January in San Diego. Brand new course about how to find stuff like this and identify it correctly. Um, but it's not a Pentas course really, it's actually more of a how do you find this kind of stuff in your, in your enterprise, in your organization. So Equifax, ob Equifax obviously failed, right? Um, and they blamed one single person in their IT shop, which is really unfair because there should be layers of controls, there should be policy, procedures, uh, methods of identifying, and honestly from the development shop side, you know, they should be aware of the dependencies in their application, what kind of framework they're using, what kind of libraries it needs, what version it is. You know, all so many things had to go bad uh, and work incorrectly for Equifax not to identify this problem. Now I realize I'm being more than a little bit of an armchair quarterback. I don't actually know what happened there. I didn't work there. But we've seen from the, well, the snippets of that I've actually watched of the hearings that that's pretty much what happened there. So imagine you have an application and it's been a bad year for struts, right? Honestly, it's been a seriously bad year for struts. Anyone using it must be going, huh, maybe we should use something else. So I wrote this slide uh, last week and I put three in there for RCEs this year, remote code execution vulnerabilities, and I think we're up to four as of today. That's pretty nasty. So what I wanted to do now is actually demo both looking for the struts issue and exploiting it. So two things, let's take a look at struts. So I'm gonna to flip to a VM. This is the course VM from 642, which is called Samurai WTF, or the Web Testing Framework. Yeah, honestly, that's what it stands for, Web Testing Framework. And I have my handy browser open, and I have Burp sitting there. Burp is an exception proxy used commonly by pentesters to assess applications. And if you can see the bar here, I'm talking to struts. Dot sex six four two dot org, and Tomcat is listening on eight zero eight zero. Tomcat is serving up an application called Showcase. Showcase is an application created by the Struts project to show off or showcase features of Struts. So I went back in time and downloaded the one from before March this year, and it happens to now be vulnerable to all of the exploits from this year. So I also have some things I can use to try and identify are we vulnerable to struts and is it exploitable? So first off, let's take a look down here, listing in my download directory, I have strutspwn.py. Let's try that one, dot slash struts dash h. And it says, I can do a dash dash check to see if it's vulnerable. Excellent, with a dash U for URL. So I'm going to do dash U, and I'm just going to put in the base URL. So struts.sex642.org. I'm going to tell it it's listening on port 8080. Dash, dash, check. And this, I would imagine, might be something that they did. They might have run Nessus or other things that they did at Equifax. And it says, not affected, huh, but I'm pretty darn sure that it actually is vulnerable. Here's the cool thing. You have to hit a dot .action file that actually does something. So let's try that again. So 
So just try that again, just copy the URL that I know is actually hitting a dot .action file, something actually working in the application, and it says vulnerable. Isn't that funny? The base URL says not, put in the full URL to where the application is actually talking to us, and we get vulnerable. Well, let's just go to town. Let's not do dash dash check. Let's actually exploit that puppy. And it runs the ID command. So we're running as Tomcat, not as root. Isn't that wonderful? Because we don't want to be running as root. The problem is if your web server or your web service is running as root is anything you do can have drastic consequences. I suppose from an adversary point of view, you jump up and down when you see you're running as root. From the pen point of view, you go, oh no, I can't believe they're running as root. Because you have to be much more careful uh, in the things that you do because you could do whatever you wanted. That can't be good. Let's try something else. Let's try dash C touch slash TM, that's not right, touch slash TMP slash Adrian was here. Okay, and let's see if it's actually there. Looks like we can do pretty much anything we want in here and actually see the response. Isn't that lovely? So a fully interactive command injection, I could pop a shell, I could put a back door, I'm limited as Tomcat, but you know, there's possibilities of privilege escalation to escape the Tomcat user and become other users or root. Um, even more importantly, I'm the user that has access to all the source code, um, perhaps even can get access to a database. So this is ridiculously easy and time's up, right? It's all, all over for this particular application, possibly the entire server, just from one vulnerability. As I said, struts having a bad day. And this is a file, that, so struts pwn is easily findable. You can you know Google it um, or just email me, I'll tell you where it is. Um, and, or you can even email it to you. So this is like, you know, putting a, a loaded uh, gun into the hands of any child and say, here you go, and boom, bad things happen, right? And this is becoming more and more common that very good, well-written exploit code is being seen on the internet. Just want to share, I often put what I think are somewhat humorous um, backgrounds when I'm playing uh, games or, or teaching or giving presentations. If having a coffee in the morning doesn't wake you up, to try deleting a table in a production database instead. You can imagine, you know, if you were at work one day and you ran something like the struts exploit against a production server and it came back, you are vulnerable, by the way, here's the ID of the user you're running as. It's like, oh, that's not good. Not good at all. So that's struts for you. That's one of the four vulnerabilities this year. I'm gonna say it again, it's been a bad year for struts. So a lot of this stuff deals with input sanitization. So you get some input, imagine you're the application, you get something from a user, you have to assume it's bad, it's evil, and it might do bad things for you, and you should check to see what's in there. Now, some of these applications make use of things, something called serialization. Essentially, they pass back and forth a serialized object. Imagine that the server creates a serialized object, like binary JSON, gives it to you, then asks for it back. You give it back to the server, and the server says, oh, well, you know, you couldn't possibly have changed it because I serialized it, which is a very strange assumption because, you know, it's not that hard to deserialize an object as long as we know what it is and put other things in there. So effectively becomes a brand new attack vector for applications that use serialized objects. So then you'd imagine that, you know, the server should do validation and check and, and sanitize input coming back from this user in a serialized object. And here's the weird thing. They don't always do that. Oh, so server gives me something, says, don't look at it, don't change it, give it back when I ask for it, like a cookie. 
They give it to me, I change it, I give it back, and bad things happen on the server because they don't check things. And here's the weird thing. So what kind of bad things can happen on the server due to serialization issues? The answer is it depends what this application does with the data when it gets it back. Is it possible we can get SQL injection, no SQL injection, LDAP, XXE, all buffer overflows? It, it depends on how the application processes, it parses, and does something with the data at their end, which we might not, might not always get to see. So here's in pictures, right? The application gives you something, you change it in some way, give it back, and then perhaps the application runs that data as code, and now we have logic running from the attacker inside the application. This could possibly be good. Going back to the problem here is, assuming that the attacker could not possibly change a serialized object, or assuming that, of course, it's fine, because I'm the one who made it and gave it to the user. So what kinds of things use serialized object? And the answer is pretty much all of the frameworks, Perl, PHP, Java, Python, Ruby, ASP.NET, pretty much all of them. Some of them are text-based, meaning XML and JSON. Some of them are binary-based. For example, msbin is an XML format for ASP.NET that is serialized and binary. So we have these things, and it's, this has been known since 2017 when the Java unsafe deserialization issue was first raised. So you'd imagine it's been fixed, right? Well, it has been fixed inside a couple of different places. First off, you could try and fix it in your application. Second place you can try and fix it is if they've updated the framework, you update the framework. The third place is perhaps it may be in an underlying library that Java makes use of, a Java library that the framework uses. So these three different places can be places you can try and fix serialization bugs. So here we have Jenkins. Jenkins CVE 2017. Oh, you know what? Oh, I'm, that's a boo-boo in the slide. That's a boo-boo in the slide. It is not, that's, oh, that's the one from the, that's the wrong one. It's actually more like 2015. Jenkins, 2015-8103, goodness, 2015-8103, is that right, is that what I said? In any case, this is an excellent reference for the Jenkins.py where I got it. And it, of course, doesn't actually tell us the CVE. That uh, was the other reference. Jenkins, Rapid 7, 2015-8103. There you go. Sorry about that. This is what happens when you don't review your slides before you talk. In any case, so 2015-8103, Jenkins comes out. There's a CVE, and it says, if you have this version or older, allows attackers to execute arbitrary code, there's that magic three words, via crafted serialized object in a library called Commons Collections. In fact, in this particular case, Commons Collections 1, or in something called YSO Serial. Oddly enough, CVE is only 7.5. But if you think about it, Jenkins is used by many enterprises to automate things, to run a shell, to compile code, to move code around, a bunch of things. But it's not just Jenkins. WebLogic, WebSphere, JBoss, and Open Network Management System, NMS, were all vulnerable, and others. So this is a class of blood bug that affects many, many, many applications. And I keep picking on Java, but realize it's also Perl, Python, Ruby, ASP.NET, and all the others all have these type of serialized objects. And if they deserialize them in an insecure way, and make use of the input without validating what's in them, bad things might happen. Hmm. It's been a bad few years for Java. This is, this is getting out of hand, right? Um, and we keep using Java. Now, I'm going to share and 
Jason's going to groan right about now because I'm going to overshare like I usually do. So I grew up in a big city called Montreal and I did not live in the nice part of Montreal. I lived in the other side and in the we lived in a building and in the back of the building there was a sandbox in a big city. Just imagine the kinds of things you find in a sandbox in a big city. I won't say it but you know what they are. So to me the sandbox smelled like cat pee. To this very day, anytime anyone says sandbox, I think, and sometimes actually say out loud, cat pee. And again, my friend Moses was like, Adrian, you did not just hashtag cat pee. And we talked about this online in Twitterverse a few weeks ago, and I said, yeah, you know what? You can hashtag anything. I hashtagged Java sandbox cat pee, or just hashtag cat pee. Because whenever you say sandbox, I think cat pee. So, Let's take a look at this Jenkins thingy. Uncheck for questions. Okay, not seeing questions. Please do ask questions or feel free to ask questions if you wish. I'm gonna switch back to my VM. All right, so that was the last vulnerability. So let's look at the new one. So I'm gonna do a curl of Jenkins dot six 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 four two dot org. Of course I typo that. There, see that's why I need to go it says try port eighty. You're right. You know what? I put that file there. I know I should try port eighty. Why am I doing this? I'm doing this because when you talk to Jenkins, there is another thing that listens at Jenkins. It also says whoops for dash V for verbose. I need to see the headers. Or I could do this. I guess we could do this in um, burp as well. That's not the dash v. There we are. Right here. These headers. So there's an older version, an older protocol that Jenkins talks called Hudson, and it says I also speak Hudson version one three nine five. I speak Jenkins version one six three seven, and my command line interface port is on three four five five one. On that port, I speak the Hudson protocol, the old Jenkins protocol, and the newer Jenkins CLI2 protocol. The two newer ones are encrypted. The old one is not. So if, for example, they passed me a serialized object and I passed it back on the CLI port, and I knew that CLI port used a particular library, I might be able to execute code based on that vulnerability I just saw. Let's check another couple things. Let's go to Jenkins. Dot sec six four two dot org. Port eighty eighty. And we see login. But look way down here, way down here, bottom right hand side. Jenkins version one six three seven. It says I have a REST API. I have a CLI API. I have all kinds of things I can do to Jenkins, and it tells me all kinds of ways I can interact with Jenkins. Oh, that's just lovely. So, I'm pretty sure we have a vulnerable server, and I have a CVE. So, can I check to see if it's vulnerable? Let's try this one. Dot slash serialize killer dash h, and it says dash dash URL. Okay, dash dash URL. Jenkins dot six six four two dot org colon 8080. Let's see if we're vulnerable. Mm. That's odd. Didn't work. Mm. Okay, I'm going to skip to actually explain then. This worked earlier. Um, hmm. Let's actually make the exploit. So Java dash jar, we need to create a serialized object. We're going to use YSO serial to do so. Of course. There. So it says payload type, which goes below, command to execute. So payload type in this case 
I check and do a bunch of research, and it says that Jenkins uses Commons Collections 1. So I run this again with the payload type, and I want to do touch slash TMP slash Adrian dash new file. And I put that into a file called payload. All right, then I'm going to do the file command on payload, and it tells me this is in fact a properly formatted Java serialized object. Well, that's interesting. What's in it? What's in payload? Let's check to see what's in payload, and we see inside the file called payload. There's a whole bunch of stuff, and it looks like Java, 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 and oh, there it is. Touch TMP Adrian new file. So my command is in there somewhere, and actually the rest of it says, by the way, Java, go run this command for me using a Java system call. All right, so I have a payload. Now I need a method of delivering this payload. Enter Jenkins PY. It says I need arguments. I need arguments of port. So let's say I need an argument of, say, Jenkins, the host name, and port 8080. It's going to query 8080, ask for the command line interface port, and then fire the exploit over the other port. Interesting. I'm having technical difficulties. So let's go see if that worked. Let's SSH in the server. Do, 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 do. And pop open a shell on that server. Oh, my wrong server. Adrian, demo, 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 demo. Demo gods. There we go. It did not work. Interesting. Okay, well, in my experience, when that happens, what you do is remake the payload. Java dash char common collections one touch slash tm. MP slash Adrian. Remake the payload. And off slash Jenkins. Jenkins dot six four two dot org space eighty eighty space payload. Oh did I forget the payload? That's why. Silly, silly, silly. There. My goodness. Now first off, problems with this exploit. Doing correctly. Not hard, create a payload, fire it. This is complete blind command injection. Notice that I don't see any response back from the server. The other problem with this exploit is it's not just completely blind, I don't see what happened, but I'm also limited by the Java system call and the fact that there's a blacklist, there's a number of commands you cannot work, run on this server, and netcat on the server is compiled without the dash E option. So, invalid option. So, many problems trying to get this exploit to work. Popping a shell would be problematic. You probably have to be 64 and code your payload. Number of other problems with that particular technique. So, I'll call that second demo partially successful. Um, 
Jason made me put the slide in. This is all Jason's fault. He asked me to put in Sec 460. It's a brand new course where it's a beta in January in San Diego. Second beta will be in uh, Philadelphia, I think, later on, and will be live probably in June or July of next year. So Enterprise Threat and Vulnerability Assessment. And I'm seeing that the question window is popping. It's Carol asking for questions. Please do pose questions. I will answer them to the best of my ability. And if you've ever met me, you'll know that I'll be brutally honest and tell you exactly what I think. Sometimes Peter, it's a good thing. Yes, sir. First question. Uh, uh, from questions. Uh, where can I read more on the new Strud phone from today? I don't know. I have not written anything up or read anything up on it sometimes. The isc.sansa.edu site will have something up there. And the answer is Apple up. Oh my goodness. Wow. So there were a ton of Apple updates today. Oh my goodness. Wow. And DNS issues and nothing. Um, so we'd have to check the struts site, which means there's probably nothing list of vulnerabilities for this year and is that the one from today you know September you know it's interesting I'm not sure I have not I, I saw it come out and I read it briefly and I said oh my, I should read more about that and I have not seen anything new about it yet so unfortunately my response is I have not seen an authoritative source of information for that vulnerability yet And I have no idea if it's actually exploitable. Um, it said possibly, which means it probably has a fairly low CSS score. Does that answer the question? Adrian, I, I have a question. Do you have <laughs> your own home lab, or what do you do to practice at home some of these things? Absolutely. So I have a couple of labs. One is, of course, the lab that I've created for 642 uh, with my partner, Justin Searle. We created. I make use of that lab. We created another lab for the 460 course, and I have an entire lab of other things, mainly just applications that I download from places and play with. Um, there are deliberately vulnerable applications that are out there, but I also like to pen test unknown vulnerabilities in unknown applications I've never seen before. So pick random open source project and play with it in bad ways. Any other questions? Uh, go ahead and type them into the window. If, uh, oh, Andrew here uh, gave us, I don't know if you can see this, Adrian, but he gave a link to the uh, Struts phone from today. Oh, cool. I would like to see that because I know 15707. Interesting. Of course, opening up <coughs> links from students, 2017, <laughs> dash, was it 15? 707, yeah, this can be a bad thing, doing this live on, it, but, you know, <laughs> that could it be, right? <laughs> um, Strats, Rust plugin, updated just on the denial service tech. Ah, oh, boring. Uh, so it's actually from a couple days ago. You know, my imagination's funny. I thought I only saw it this morning or yesterday. But it's one of those things where, you know, you're getting a little, little bit older. Um, you know, memories sometimes of first thing to go, or at least memory is the first thing to go, we don't know what other things have gone because they don't work anymore, and you don't remember them. <laughs> How's that for sad? Currently have no other questions. I think uh, that'll be it for today. All right, cool. So let's see. Two demos. Uh, talked about struts. Talked about Java in general. Talked about frameworks. Talked about 642, talked about 460, and a possibly upcoming course called 442, which we'll write next year, will be available in 2019. My name is Adrian. I like to break stuff and like to talk about breaking things. All right. Well, thank you so much, Adrian and Jason, for your great presentation, which helps bring this content to the SANS community. To our audience, we greatly appreciate you listening in. For a schedule of all upcoming and archived SANS webcasts, including this one, please visit sans.org forward slash webcasts. Until next time, take care, and we hope to have you back again for the next SANS webcast.
Woohoo!